to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Word of God says, It is appointed to man once to die, and then the judgment. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may give an account for the things done in the body, whether good or evil. One day, all of us will leave this life. And friend, one day we will all stand before the almighty throne of God. In view of that, I need and you need salvation from God. Welcome to our study of the subject of salvation. Today we're going to be thinking about the fact that I need, that every individual needs salvation and what it is we're saved to and what it is we're saved from in eternity. The fact that heaven is going to be wonderful and the fact that we're going to be saved to heaven and the fact that hell is going to be horrible and that we're saved from a sinner's hell. And so we welcome you today to our study of this wonderful subject relating to salvation. As always, we want to encourage you to visit the Gospel of Christ website. TheGospelOfChrist.com is the way that you can find that on the internet. From our website, you can find all of our lessons available to one free of charge. You can listen to our CDs or watch our videos. If you'd like to have a hard copy of that for yourself on DVD, we'd be glad to send that to you free of charge. Just fill out our media request form on the internet and we can make that available to you as well. And friend, we want to encourage you to visit the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in your area. The Church of Christ and the members of the Churches of Christ would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to sit down and have a personal Bible study, they'd be more than happy to do that with you. Let's then begin to think about our soul in view of eternity. Let's think about the fact that I need salvation from a sinner's hell and to the beautiful place we call heaven. I want you to think with me in this first part of our lesson about how that nobody would ever in the right mind want to be lost in hell. You know, when we think about hell, uh, what's it going to be like? Uh, what is hell? What does the Bible teach about that subject of hell? You know, not, we don't hear much today on the subject of hell. Probably in most places, it's been a long, long time since we heard a sermon on what hell is going to be like. But friend, there's a value to that. As I think about what is hell, and as I think about the subject of hell, this motivates and this challenges a person to be saved in view of that. I don't want to go to hell. I want to live in such a way that I'm right in the sight of God, and it is a, a preventative to make sure that I remain true to God's teaching. And so I want to invite you to open your Bible with me to Luke, the 16th chapter, and let's think about a man who went to hell. Let's think about this man's journey through torment, and let's see just how horrible it was for this man and see what lessons we can learn that will promote and prevent us from being lost for all eternity. Open your Bible, if you would, to Luke chapter 16, and I want you to begin with me in verse number 19. The Bible says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was, the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now notice this. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Friend, as you think about this man's journey to torment, 
What is torment going to be like? What's hell going to be like? Friend, it's a place of horrible, horrible torment. Uh, if you can imagine being in such agony, being in such pain and torment that you, that you would almost hope to die. You would beg to die and you would live forever. You know, as you think about the idea of torment, think about maybe when you felt sick in your life. Think about maybe when you felt really, really bad. You were so sick and you felt so bad that you probably say to yourself, death would almost be better than this. If you've ever been in that kind of torment, whether it be mental or whether it be emotional torment, you know how bad that is. Can you imagine living forever in a state where you would almost wish for death and yet living in that moment of time for all eternity, being in that kind of torment for the rest of your life? Can you imagine that? Well, look a little further as you think about the rich man and, and what he had to face. We also learn that hell is a place of fire. Notice in your Bible in Luke chapter 16 what the text says in verse number 24. The scripture says, Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. What's going to be so horrible? Why do I need salvation from hell? Friend, hell is going to be a place of unquenchable fire. Listen to the words of Jesus in Mark chapter 9, verse 44. Hell is a place, Jesus said, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. When you think about the rich man's words here, have mercy on me, send Lazarus, I just need one drop of water. Why? I'm tormented in this flame. You ever had to deal with a burn? Everybody in their life at one point or another has maybe burned themselves. Maybe you're in the kitchen and, and you accidentally touched a hot pan and it burned you. Maybe you've played with fireworks and got burned. Maybe in your work you somehow got burned. Or, or maybe even worse, you were in some type of fire and you got burned by that fire. You know how hurt, how bad a, a burn hurts how it makes your skin boil up, how that when you pop it and touch it, it just hurts so much, the, the pain and the anguish. In fact, I once heard a story of a preacher who went into a hospital, and he was in the burn wing, and he said, you just cannot imagine how horrible that part of the hospital was. He said, from the moment you walk through those double doors, the, the, the screams, and the anguish and the pain of those people with those burns on their bodies as they're tending the wounds, as they're dressing them, as they're taking care of them, just the agony and the pain that they're writhing in, said it can't be rivaled with anything. And truly, nothing hurts nearly as bad as a burn. Now, why do we say those things? Why do we make you think about that? Friend, the Bible describes hell as a place of fire. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Revelation chapter 14, verse number 11 says, it's a place of burning brimstone, of fire and brimstone. Revelation describes it in Revelation chapter 20. Imagine now living in a place of eternal fire forever. Nobody would want to do that. Now you think about this. You just imagine this with me. Let's say... Uh, would you do this? You think about this. If you had a cigarette lighter, would you light that lighter and hold your finger over it and burn yourself? Well, of course not. If you were at the house and your oven was cranked up to 500 degrees, would you stick your hand in there and hold it in for a good while? No. Why? It'd burn you. You'd do whatever you could to prevent being burned. You're not going to burn yourself. You're not going to stick your hand in a hot oven. You're not going to jump in a fire. Why not? I don't want to be burned. I'm going to do whatever it takes to prevent that. And yet, now is the opportunity. Now is the time to prevent living forever in torment. And so many people are living as though they have no fear of the eternal torment and the fire of hell. What else do we know about this man's journey to hell? This is probably the worst thing. It's not necessarily the physical torment. 
it's not necessarily the, the pain and the torture of the fire. But friend, probably one of the worst things about hell is that there's going to be mental recognition in hell. Listen to Luke chapter 16, verse number 25. But Abraham said, now listen to this, Son, remember that in your lifetime you receive good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. What's going to be horrible about hell? Your memory will not be erased. You will remember in hell. God said to the rich man, Son, Abraham said, Son, remember now, you had it pretty good back on earth. You had all the fine things, all the luxuries. Lazarus, not so. Now the roles are kind of reversed, aren't they? This man squandered his opportunity. He didn't use what he had to glorify God. He didn't help Lazarus. He wasn't a very good man. And he's going to remember that for all eternity. Friend, what's going to be horrible about hell? The fact that I will remember. Uh, think about this for a moment. Can you imagine sitting in the halls of hell, thinking about what you should have done, thinking about the opportunities that you overlooked, thinking about the time that you almost changed your life and obeyed the gospel. You think about, I almost became a Christian. I almost gave up this pet sin, whatever it may be. I almost, almost is going to be one of those haunting words in hell. Don't let that be in your heart and your life for all eternity. Instead of thinking if I should have or would have or could have, make changes now because your memory and mine will not be erased in eternity. We will be able to remember some of those things. And then of course the Bible teaches another horrible thing about hell is that hell is a place of eternal separation. Listen to Luke chapter 16 Verse number 26, this man's journey then goes further when the Bible tells us, and besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. What do we know about hell? It's a place of eternal separation. There's no crossing over. Uh, the rich man says, just send Abraham to get one drop of water to cool my tongue. I'm tormented in this flame. Son, remember, you had it good on life. He's got it good now. He says, well, let me go back. And, no, no crossing over. There's a great gulf. And the word gulf means a, a, a wide, deep chasm that nobody could get across. You can't get across it. No, no going back and forth. The idea is that of separation. There's no going back and forth. If one is lost, it's eternal. The separation will be eternal. Friend, hell is going to be horrible because if I don't live right and obey the gospel and become a Christian now, it's too late on the other side. You're not going to buy anybody out of there. That's not taught in the Bible. You can't do enough good works to get somebody out of... That, that's not taught in the Scripture. Now is the opportunity. This is my one chance to get right with God or I'm going to be separated for all eternity. Think about that. I'm going to be separated from God. I'm going to be separated from Jesus Christ. I'm going to be separated from all good, righteous, and holy people. And I am going to not only be separated from God and all that's good, I'm going to be with, without the possibility of getting away, I'm going to be with the devil and his angels and evil, ungodly, immoral people without the possibility of ever being separated from them either? Think about how horrible that would be on the other side. You know, when you think about this separation, you also have to think about how good it's going to be to go to heaven. I need salvation not only because I don't want to go to hell and be lost for eternity, but I need salvation because I want to be saved and I want to go to heaven. I want you to think about uh, the beauty and the splendor of that place called heaven. You know, Christians often sing the song, how beautiful heaven must be, how true that is. We sing songs like the Paradise Valley and we, we think about the, uh, how wonderful it's going to be. Friend, heaven really is a beautiful place of rest. 
I want you to look in the Bible in Hebrews chapter 4. And I want you to notice, now let's think about some passages that relate to heaven. I want you to think about with me Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 9. Listen to what the Word of God says about the beautiful rest of heaven. Scripture says, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Think about how beautiful heaven's going to be. Think about how wonderful that place called heaven is. And, and don't you want to go there? It's a place of rest. You know, when you think about rest, imagine it this way. Let's say that you've gone out and you've worked harder than you've ever worked before. You've been involved in some type of strenuous manual labor from sun up to sundown, whatever that may be. You're tired, your body aches. The one thing you want is rest for the old weary body. Well, when you think about that, think about it in a spiritual sense. The soul and the spirit, which has fought with sin, which has struggled every day with the world, which has done battle against Satan, which is worn out and tired from all that, it's a place of rest for the spirit and the soul. There'll be no more sorrow, death, pain, crying, all the sin, all those former things will have passed away. Don't you want to go to that beautiful place of rest where God Himself is? But you know, as you think about heaven, I need salvation and I want to go to heaven because evil is going to be absent in heaven. I want you to notice next, Revelation chapter 21, verse number 4. Listen to these beautiful words. The Bible says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. The things that bring us so much heartache, in this life. They don't exist on the other side. There'll be no death. You know, won't it be wonderful that when you get to heaven, you'll never hear the news, you'll never read the obituary in the paper, you'll never have somebody call you and say, did you hear so and so died? No more death. There'll be no more crying. I won't have to shed tears on the other side. There'll be no more sorrow. Death, sorrow, crying, uh, there'll be no more pain. You're, you won't hurt. You won't we won't have to deal with disease and sickness and cancer and heart attacks and strokes and, and things like that. All those former things will have passed away. You know, isn't it a beautiful picture of God in Revelation 21, 4? God is pictured as wiping away every tear from their eyes. You know, when I think about this, I think about an illustration when I was a young kid, uh, sometimes we would stay at my grandmother's house. And I remember specifically, we would play and we'd sometimes get rambunctious. And as kids do, sometimes you'd fall down and scrape your knee or sometimes you'd hurt your elbow or you'd get hurt sometimes. You'd go to your grandmother crying maybe. And I remember every time, uh, grandmother would take us up. And she'd take that apron that people in that day and age wore, and she'd take that apron, bring us up in her arms, and she'd just wipe away every tear. And before you knew it, you didn't even know why you were crying. You didn't even know what was wrong. All you knew was that you were in that place of safety, and Grandma had wiped away every tear. Friend, I want you to think about God like that. What's heaven going to be like? It's a place of safety. There isn't the heartache and the pain that we face now. God is going to bring us up and wipe away every tear from our eye. And we won't feel the things that we feel in this life. You know, when you think about what makes heaven great, heaven's going to be wonderful and I need to be saved to heaven because God is going to be there. When I was a, a young person and I used to hear things about heaven, and I used to read the Bible as it spoke about heaven, I would often think that, you know, the things that are going to make heaven great are the, uh, the, the jewels and the diamonds and the pearly gate and the river, all those you know, physical, touchable images that we think about. I don't really think now that's the main thing that's going to make heaven great. What is the number one thing that makes heaven great? I think Jesus mentioned it in Matthew 6, verse 9. Jesus said, In this manner, therefore pray, our Father who is in heaven. What makes heaven great? Friend, listen carefully. If God is in heaven, that's what will make heaven great. The God of love, 1 John 4, verse 8. 
the God of light, John 8 verse 12, if Jesus Christ, the great sacrifice is there, that'll make heaven heaven. Being in the presence of God for all eternity. Living with the saints of old. Being with loved ones who've passed on. That's heaven. That's what makes it wonderful. That's what it, it's not necessarily the, the jewels or the, the pearly gates or the river. No, all those images are wonderful things. Don't get me wrong. But if God's there, that's what makes heaven heaven. Don't you want to go to heaven? And friend, I'll assure you of this today. Heaven, no matter what you face, no matter what you have to go through, no matter what things you have to give up, heaven will be worth it all. There's a final Bible passage that I want you to think about with me that really illustrates how heaven is worth whatever you've got to face and whatever you've got to give up to go there, heaven's worth it. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 8 verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, listen now, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What Paul say? Heaven's going to be worth it all. The sufferings you face now, the difficulties that you incur. People may laugh at you. People may mock you. You may have to face difficulties and challenges in this life. You may have to give up and you may have to suffer to be a Christian. But you know what Paul said? Compared to that, heaven's going to be worth it. The glory that's one day going to reveal, be revealed in us, it doesn't even compare. Those things don't even compare to what heaven's going to be like. Paul could definitely say that, could he not? He'd done a lot of things that were not pleasing to God. But when he changed his life, he truly gave up, didn't he? He spent his life spreading the gospel. Paul was stoned at certain times in Lystra and uh, other areas, Iconium, Acts 14. He was beaten. He was stranded out in the sea. He faced shipwreck. He was put in prison. Uh, all that, Paul said, isn't even worthy to be compared with what we'll one day receive. Friend, I hope today that you'll think seriously about why we need salvation. I hope that you'll think with a view toward eternity. Are, are you thinking seriously about your soul? Are you thinking about the judgment day? Remember, Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed to man once to die, and then the judgment. There are two things, only two, that you can be sure of. We will all one day leave this life. No getting around that. And we'll all one day stand before the judgment seat of God. I will die. I will stand before God's throne and be judged. So will you. Now, in view of that, we've got to think seriously about our soul. This life is not what's important. The things of this life, the stuff, the pleasures, the, the junk that often gets in the way of people putting God first, that's not what's important. What's important is my soul and yours. And so, are you really thinking about eternity? Have you really thought about how horrible hell's going to be? Can, can, can you imagine? Just think seriously in your own mind. If I die outside of Christ and I go to hell, have I really thought about what's that's, what that's going to be like? Friend, we're saying this because God doesn't want anybody to go there. We don't want anybody to go there. We love your eternal soul and we want you to be saved, but you've got to think seriously and you've got to think reality here. The reality is I will die. I will be judged. The reality is if I haven't obeyed the gospel and I haven't lived right or I live and die in sin, I will be lost in hell, a place of, of torment, a place of fire, a, a place of, of mental recognition where I'll say to myself, why didn't I get my life right? A place of separation and a place where you'll be with the devil and his angels for all eternity. And then are you thinking seriously about your soul in view of heaven, a beautiful place of rest? a place where God is, a place where evil and all the things of this life do not haunt us, and a place where you can spend eternity with loved ones who've gone on before you who are also saved. Now friend, if you're thinking about these things seriously today, the question you need to be asking is, am I right with God? 
Have I obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? Am I a Christian and have I obeyed God's will? Now here's what we'd ask you to consider. Some people think they are a Christian, think they've obeyed the gospel, and they've not really been taught the truth on salvation. What does the Bible say you've got to do to be saved? Friend, you must hear the Word of God to be saved. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Are you willing to listen to what God and God alone says in the Bible? If you are, do you believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world? Jesus said, unless you believe that I am He, you will surely die in your sins. John 8 verse 24. Would you be willing to repent and turn to God? Luke 13, 3 and 13, 5. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Are you willing to change your way of thinking and change your way of acting? Would you turn from sin and turn to God? Would you confess the name of Jesus before men? Romans 10, 10 says, with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And friend, would you, to have every sin washed away, to become a Christian, be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Here's what the Bible teaches. Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 16, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Peter said in Acts 2, verse 38, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Saul was told, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Acts 22, 16. Baptism is that which puts us into Christ. Galatians 3, verse 27. And Peter so clearly said, Baptism does now also save us. More than anything, we want you to be saved. We want people to go to heaven and to miss out on hell. And so we urge you today, we're begging you, if you've never obeyed the gospel, if you are not a Christian or you've got sin in your life, please make that right. More than anything, we want to see you one day in heaven with all the saved. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.